name is Laurie Hoberman. After many, many eons in big law, I actually resigned from my law firm two months ago and set up my new law firm. And my associate, oh, thank you, thank you. Um, it's called the Hoberman Law Group. Thank you. My associate's sitting right here taking, taking pictures. Uh, so I actually feel after almost two decades of advising entrepreneurs that I've learned more in the last month of becoming one than, than I have in advising them. Very exciting, we're actually doing an incubator, we're forming an incubator uh, next spring. We're based down in Union Square, so a lot of good stuff going on. I'm excited to be a part of this panel. So we had a little pre-panel phone call, which I was referring to as a debate, it wasn't quite a debate, but, but we're, we're gonna be talking about kind of the democratization versus the monopolization of marketplaces. And uh, I want to have my panelists introduce each other, so each other or themselves. Let's go, Eric. I'm going to go with myself. Yeah, uh, Eric good. Mason, the uh, Director of Marketing Communications at Wix.com. Uh, Wix is a do-it-yourself website building platform that actually is democratizing the way people create their own markets in many, in many cases. Uh, prior to Wix, I actually ran my own marketing communications firm helping small businesses and entrepreneurs get online um, in new and dynamic ways over the course of about 15 years as the internet developed and actually saw the rise of this democratization. Um, and so we'll talk more about it. Thanks. Uh, my name is Micah Rosenblum. I'm a partner at Founder Collective. Uh, we're a seed stage venture firm uh, in New York, Boston, San Francisco. Uh, in some ways, we think about democratizing venture capital. I, I started three companies, one of which, by the way, was a marketplace that failed badly during the dot-com boom. So. Uh, perhaps I should uh, not like marketplaces, but I do. Um, the whole thesis around uh, Founder Collective was uh, many, all of us were founders, had challenges raising capital from traditional venture and, and said, what if entrepreneurs started a venture fund? What would that look like? A really early stage sort of quasi angel group. And that was sort of the genesis of Founder Collective. So we're all entrepreneurs. Some of, our, some of my partners are part-time. They're entrepreneurs uh, running, running their startups. Uh, we funded over 150 companies over the last five years. Uh, many of which we can talk about are, are sort of in marketplaces. So, uh, like I said, I run the New York office and we invest in all sorts of things from consumer e-commerce to B2B to a trucking business, uh, you name it, we've done some pretty interesting stuff. Great, thanks. So to make this more fun, I want to encourage audience participation. We're, we're gonna be a very interactive panel up here and to the extent you wanna interrupt us, by all means jump in. Um, I wanted to start the discussion by talking a little bit about Wix. And I think Wix is such a, a key example of the, the kind of the, the leveling the playing field, so to speak, of the marketplace. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, I touched on it earlier, and I think that we're not the only ones in this space doing it, but there is No, but a, you're sitting next to me. So I know. <laughs> I can start but I want to be fair and <laughs> platform agnostic to a degree. Um, uh, you know, we talked about marketplaces during our call, and one of the things that really came up is that there, with this democratization, is there is a capability now increasingly, um, and it is one of the disruptive forces where the the old model of sort of the ivory tower, tower model of um, having a developer and a designer absolutely necessary for someone to get online, to look amazing online, and to do to open their own market online, whether that's actual e-commerce or just building a brand online. Those walls have, are quickly being torn down and new paradigms are being set up as people get online, do things online, build communities, um, and essentially foster marketplaces for themselves, whether it's a street corner mom and pop shop or getting online and building a huge global community. So we're, we're providing those tools. We're trying to take the coding and the developing side out of it. At the same time, um, we have a marketplace ourselves where coders and developers and designers can come in and build beautiful apps, supply even greater capabilities to those, I'll call them, everyday people who just want to get online and market their business and be part of the ecosystem. Did those coders and designers view you as the enemy? Um, no. Uh, no, certainly not the ones in our app market. I think they, they view us as a, as a magnifier of their their, of their chops, of their ability and their creativity to get something out there that that can go out to a mass market of people. So I don't believe that they have ever done that. I think that some of the developers, and the, you know, I, I, I was a coder as well, so I built websites from the ground up. And there was a moment in time when I thought, well, shoot, if someone could just go on and pick a template, drag and drop stuff on the screen, what's my job? I mean, if I don't need, my, if I don't need to code, but the truth is, I did find that there was a job. It was called branding, messaging, marketing, social media. There was this whole other place that you had to go out and help those small businesses share their stuff in the market. So you have to evolve like everyone else. 
Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say one of the discussions we had over the phone, um, you know, was leading to do, do these marketplaces get too powerful and, in a sense, become monopolistic? And I think our view was sort of the positive of these marketplaces. If you think about st the stock market 50 years ago, if you wanted to buy a stock as a retail investor, you had to call some stockbroker. You didn't really know what the price of that stock is. You might have seen it in the newspaper the day before. You didn't know the price you were getting. He or she would negotiate with somebody on the phone, and then you would buy it. Now you can go online and buy in the you know second to second, actually in a fraction of a second, know exactly what the price is, exactly what you should buy it within certain parameters. And, and I think that's progress. Now you could say, have these markets, NASDAQ, NYSE, are they monopolistic? Perhaps, but I think they've brought value. And if you fast forward to today, I think Google, arguably, and some might say a monopolist, it is a marketplace, right? I mean, it, it is where it's sort of become the default place where if you're searching for something, uh, and, and most of the, you know, most of the, uh, you know, advertisers are increasingly are, are on Google. And I think there's a lot being made today about Uber and, and pick your pick your example. Uh, but I think in general, these marketplaces have brought us progress. And I think as investors, uh, we, we you know, we've invested in a number of these on the belief that greater transparency, removing the middlemen uh, is a good thing for, uh, you know, economic progress and that the sort of both parties win. There's this great site out there called 99designs. Anybody ever use 99designs? So there's that site generates a little bit of controversy also. All right, you're laughing, Eric. Go ahead. You're on. <laughs> You've got friends there. You talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, 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 I actually you I, used it more than I, 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 I. Yeah, it's only as a, a, a user. And I, and I said to one of my partners uh, who is a designer by trade, and I said, Oh yeah, I just went, I got our new logo on 99 Designs. It looks awesome. You know, all these people competed for it. He's like, you didn't. Like that's not where good design happens. Like you need to talk to a designer, and they've got to have the right aesthetic and the feeling and all this. And like, you know, let me tell you, let me introduce you to some good designers. They probably can't work with us for a couple months because they're so busy. And I was like, we needed cards like yesterday. This happened in 24 hours. So I, I do think there's this funny. Uh, my understanding is they're doing very, very well, and I think the, the, there's a sense that how can you commoditize design? I think at the most highest echelons, maybe it, it, it won't work this way, but I think for the vast majority of us who just need a logo, just need a quick template for a PowerPoint or a website, it's probably good enough. I don't know. Yeah, I, w I would agree, obviously. I mean, we work in, a, in a, an industry that's actually pretty similar. Building tools that allow people to build something for themselves. Now, 99design is different because they actually are a structured marketplace where people compete, they throw off their stuff, you, you pick the one you like and you get the lowest possible price, which is part of the draw. Um, but it's pretty threatening, I think, to people to, ha to realize that, they, that the thing they saw as an elite upper echelon sort of skill set is yeah. suddenly being either replaced by tools or replaced by marketplaces that drive costs down. But I, I think this goes back to what I was saying earlier, is that the, building a logo is the first part of building a business, it's not building a business. Building a website actually isn't building a business. You act, there's so many other steps that go into that. Content creation, uh, branding initiatives, offline initiatives, all those things are actually at the real bread and butter of what makes anything go in the, in the real world. So we, we do provide a commodity. It's building, building, building tools for websites. 99design provides a marketplace and commoditizes the logo, but the logo, for anybody who's in the room, is not your brand. You know, as it turns out. It's a great thing to have, but there's been some crappy logos for really successful companies. I mean, Google comes to mind. You know, it's, and again, it's not the great logo. Bucks, you, can, you can get right? a new one every month. And it changes all the time. Yeah. Google just breaks every rule in the logo thing, but they've got a brand, and the brand is pretty sweet. I, I think one interesting thing about 99designs and where internet marketplaces are particularly interesting is that I think creative used to be kind of local. Like, you, you'd sort of want to sit down with the designer, maybe national at best, and, and I think probably the thing that was threatening and probably the brilliance is, you know, you get all these designs, some are from Indonesia and some are from India and some are from China, you know, and like, and it doesn't matter. It's sort of like the best one wins um, and, and the, the one you, you, that appeals to you the most. And I think, I, I do think there, there are probably a set of people who feel threatened by the globe that, the, the fact that the global creative world can bid on your product, can create for your project. I, I think that's, as a user, better. That means like more people are actually working on it. Um, and I think that's sort of the power of the internet is like a company in, you know, Detroit can have a logo created by someone in 
in Asia, and, and it works just the same. So I'll give a personal example of illustrating what you just said. So I have a I have a 65 year old sister who owns a coffee shop, several coffee shops in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, I've been at Wix for about three years. I was on a radio program about a week after I got the job, and I was challenging the radio host to have his son go out and just try our tool. Just go out and try it. It's not what you think it is. Um, about a week later, I get a phone call back, and it's my sister in tears on the phone. She's in tears because for the last 20 years, she's been having to go to an intermediary to art sit down with that designer, that developer, and articulate her vision for what she wanted to have online. It comes back weeks or months later. It's not quite what she wanted. She wants small change that takes time, costs her a ton of money. She's gone on to the internet and started playing around not only with our tool, but with other tools. And she's in tears because she finally says, for the first time in my life, I don't feel, and I've been feeling this way for a long time, that technology has been leaving me behind. I now feel like I can do this myself. I can make this happen for myself. And that's the power of the democratization of a marketplace. When you can say, listen, I'll roll out my cart, I'll bring my wares, and I'll sell them. And I'll, and I'll t take control of this myself. To me, that's the, that is the difference. And, and yeah, it's disruptive, but it's also empowering to all these other people. And so to say, my job's being threatened, it's like, yeah, but 10 other jobs are being created, evolve, adapt, everyone else is having to do it. Yeah, I, I just went through the process of doing my website and picking a logo. Three months to pick a logo. I don't think I ever <laughs> and, and it was my good friend who did the designing and she did my website. And a client of mine said to me, why aren't you using 99 designs? <laughs> and, and you know, so part of the reason clearly was I had a good friend who was doing a logo that makes me feel good to do such designs and, and good to use the website. But in talking to her about how she's building her business, she needs to be aware of these other, uh, other, other options for people that I think make life much easier. Like your sister's Well, saying, and I think it also, accessible. it also just allows you to shop around. I mean, the, 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 the variety of things that you can actually choose from, there's not one way that you have to get a logo designed anymore. I mean, this is the harbinger of a great marketplace, right? It's dynamic. Completely. And I, but I think it's also teaching the people who play in the marketplace that they have to, they have to get with it. Or otherwise they're gonna be left behind. But I, I think, you know, again, on the optimistic note, it's, benef it's beneficial for the supply side, for, for the creatives as well, if, if they come around to it. And, and I think it's true in, in a lot of different markets. Like take publishing. Um, you know, it used to be to, to be a writer, you would have to write for a certain magazine or, you know, and there were only so many jobs. And yeah, look, I understand that the newspaper business, the magazine business is, is going through pretty rocky times. The flip side of it is now, like, it's much easier for somebody to publish something on Twitter, or publish something on Medium, have a WordPress, you know, have a Wix site. Like, I think there's so many avenues now in which you can get published and distribution that now not any, it, it doesn't have to be like a very small set of people who can write. I, I, I can choose to, you know, put, put my thoughts out there. Any one of us can. And I think in the end that, that creates more supply and, and creatives, you know, you might have a really great logo designer who's, who's uh, insurance salesman by day, but at night, like, and, and previously they would have no way to kind of leverage their out, I've just picked that out of the air, but like <laughs> now with 99 designs, like they can exercise and make some income nights. The same is true of Uber drivers, same is true, like pick your marketplace. I think that also is the disruptive power of these things is that the supply side doesn't have to be a dedicated X. It can, it can sort of come globally, it can come in a part-time fashion. Um, I, I, I think that's, and I think you're seeing that across many new marketplaces. Look at music. I mean, all you, you could sing into that microphone and put something you out. You don't want there. me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, question. Yeah, so, 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 so are, are you on? Uh -oh. <laughs> cool. Tomatoes thrown now. Wait, wait, wait. He's sitting far enough away. Students are incredible in terms of demand for their talent. One of the reasons is because marketing so your tools are actually helping uh, students to do things um, faster, but that underlying in terms of you know, skill, in terms of knowing, in terms of color theory, understanding, you know, that can't be replaced. So you know, while some of these things, 99 design, okay, you can go get something cheap that's out there, and there's going to be a market for that, but there, there's still a huge demand for quality design. No, no question, I but I, I, I think the hard part was, you correct me if I'm wrong, it, it, it was probably very hard historically for your students to get jobs. There were only a finite number of jobs. Uh, oh, did everyone hear what, he, what, he, what, he, what this gentleman said? Okay, so, so, so um, 
because I, I wouldn't repeat it as well as you, you said it. But I, I guess my point was going to be, I think this opens up more opportunities for your students to find ways to use their skills um, as opposed to making them smaller. Maybe you disagree with that. But I, I actually, it seems to me there's now more and more opportunity for creative folks, whether it's within all sorts of companies because design is so much more important, or there's just more platforms by which they can express their abilities. I would say the same thing. The First of all, I know personally, if I had had tools like I have that I work with now, I could have taken three more, three times more clients to start because I could have worked quicker. The other thing is I would say, I 100% agree, There's, you have to have professional designers. While we have uh, people doing it yourself, we also have thousands of templates designed by our design team, which are all professional designers out of our office in Tel Aviv. In addition, while we make an amazing do-it-yourself tool, let's face it, most of us don't really want to do it ourselves. We want someone to do it for us. And so we have that capability as well. It's actually giving our tools to what we call Wix Pros that actually go out and just use our tools to build the amazing things that their clients want and then turn it over so that they can use, their clients then can use our easy to use management tools to manage and update their site in an, in an easy user friendly way. So I, I actually think that there, and I'll say one final thing is that I know from watching a lot of our users use the tools is that they quickly come to understand if they're not good at design and that they need help. So it, I, I think it actually raises the conversation level for everyone involved to go, you know what, I did this, I did it myself for a while, and I realized what I'm not good at. Maybe it's the content generation, maybe it's the color palette, maybe it's just the way, you know, UI of the site, they just don't know, and so they go out and they find that professional help. And when they have that initial conversation with that designer, they're 10 steps ahead of where they would have been before, because now they understand things like, oh, I need an e-commerce package, or I, I sort of started to learn about SEO, what does that mean? So they actually are better educated consumers because they've gone out into the marketplace and done something, in my opinion. Uh, we have a devil's advocate. I was hoping. Else could write code in is no longer able to do that because I got an Indian guy who gets paid 20 bucks a day to write, you know, with a, way smarter than me. Doesn't have a Ferrari, doesn't have my house in Atherton, doesn't have any of that other stuff, and he's happy to happy to do it for 15 different people, you know, out on you know on some you know uh, you know mm -hmm. site. Okay. Same thing goes with designers. There's a bubble in design. You know, your your your, your students pay 20 grand a year, or whatever it is, to go to school. They got a hundred thousand dollar note when they leave school. They go out in the world, and now they're competing against somebody getting paid ten bucks a day. It's democratization. I, I'm not saying it's that's bad, it's, but it's democratization. Don't come across as altruistic. I mean, we're talking what, what you're doing to people is disrupting the people that are at the top of that bubble, and you're bringing up the people at the bottom. You know, that are the, the, the you know sort of silk and suds, and you're bringing them up, and it's great. So I think I think that's I, and, that's and, and, I'm a, and I don't, we don't none of us work for philanthropic organizations. Yeah. But what I yeah. but what I, but what I would say is that. You know, I made this comment to, to Micah in the, in the green room. Wix is a company of 900 employees now. We went IPO, IPO last year. Half of them are designers and developers and engineers. If you're a great designer and you're in the room, we'll, we'll pay you that money so you can drive, well, you will probably won't drive a Ferrari in Atherton. I live in Redwood City myself. Um, and I work for the company and make a great living. Um, but I, but I, the, I, I firmly believe that there's great design jobs that pay well are available. We're hiring those people. And we're also building a consumer product so that other people can also get into the market. And it, yeah, it sounds altruistic, but it's like the printing press. The printing press, was was it altruistic? No, but it provided the opportunity for everyone to read and to learn to read. I think that's a good thing. And yes, it was probably disruptive to the monks who were sitting in the, in the, the monastery and they were the only ones that had the ability to read. And yeah, it was disruptive, okay. I, I, I'm in, I'm in. One of the things that three of us agreed on, uh, we were talking about this panel before, is that it's a, it's a potentially painful process. And and I think, you know, you're seeing some of that pain. What you're talking about is some of that pain. I've heard of thousands of people that get something better. They, you know, they get lifted up from their mud back in Bangladesh. Um, there's one person who gets tossed out of his Ferrari in his house. The, 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 the only thing I'd say about that is I've never seen salaries higher for uh, premier software engineers, premier talent. I think in some ways, yeah, I mean, we've got, I mean, in fact, there's a website, uh, I, we're not involved in it, but I know our companies use it called Hired.com, where ten, uh, technologists are bid on, basically, uh, by companies, uh, I guess that's it, literally, to, to, and, that and, and they can select based on the highest salary. So 
I, I know startups who are paying high, high six figures for talent in certain areas. So I, I agree it's about raising sort of the, the bottom into the middle, but I, I think the cream still does rise to the top. If you have it, um, unique, if you have unique skills or, you know, right now where there's high demand for software engineering, I, I actually think those guys are still getting, uh, lot, you know, well paid, lots of opportunities. So I, I also think it depends on the segment and the market. All right, I think we are, yeah? All right, thank you. Eric, Micah, thank you, great panel.